Union is the subscription management hub for B2B SaaS companies. Whether you're looking to expand to new markets, experimenting with pricing models, or simply want a streamlined quote to cash process, Union got your back. On top of that, Union Insights provides the SaaS metrics you need for reporting to the board and for future company evaluation. It gives you the key figures needed to drive your business forward and take strategic decisions. Union. We help SaaS companies manage their B2B customer subscriptions. Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRate.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from the German-speaking startup world. Today I have another recording in media partnership with the German Startup Association. Therefore, I would like to welcome Milan. Hey, how you doing? Hello, I'm Milan. Good to see you. Probably my pleasure. You are here because you won the German Startup Award Newcomer of the Year 2022. Congratulations to that. Thank you. Thank you. It feels like ages ago. Meanwhile, it was last March, but so much happened in between so much change, but yes, thank you. Um, we should tell our audience that we're recording this toward end of October, but I, I can totally agree that this year feels much longer because so much is happening in the meantime. Um, you. And th th there's now two audiences out there. One of them can see you on YouTube and the other one can just hear. For the people who are hearing this, <laughs> who are seeing this, yeah. Uh, for the people who are watching this behind you, there's a production facility. We'll get soon to that. And uh, you are also pretty young. We just, um, we just realized that you graduated from high school this year and you officially enrolled at university. First, congratulations for the what? Secondly, congratulations for the high school uh, graduation. And thirdly, for the enrollment at university. So um, you have started out pretty young. You started when you've been 16. Can you take us along a little bit your entrepreneur journey until now? <laughs> well, uh, you're saying the truth. It started quite early. Um, so when I was 16, I uh, started with a friend in our old garage, actually, and we were making like phone cases and 3D printed them. We made like phone cases that had copper wires inside, so you could use old phones and charge them wirelessly. That was our inter innovation, to put copper wires in 3D printed phone cases, and then you could charge like an old uh, phone, and it would be as cool as a new phone with the charging technology. And that's how we started making these phone cases with 3D printing. And that's how we got into the whole stuff. And uh, from there on, it just continued and continued. And we kind of dabbled into business and orders kept coming in. And then we started recycling old phone cases, making new ones out of them, making new 3D printing filament. And that's just kind of how it all started when I was 16. Mm -hmm. A lot of information here. But basically, um, you started out with cell phone cases and you, you 3D printed them. And that's an important step because I do believe this will take us to today because um, today you have a recycling business and a machine building business, basically both offsprings from recycling 3D printing material, filament, you call it. So can I, can I um, make it really short? That's I would call the ammunition of a 3D printer. This type of plastic, this 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 very long and spindly thing that is basically used for printing, right? Yes, it, you could describe it as the ink for 3D printers. You know how normal printers use ink? The 3D printer needs this filament. It's like a plastic wire. And uh, in order to print objects, you need the wire and it gets melted. And layer by layer, new objects are created in a 3D printer. And yeah, that's exactly how we started. And that's what we do today. So there was a gap in between, I guess, um, 
because we started recycling these phone cases and making our own filament, our own colors for the phone cases. And then at some point we just noticed, okay, this is a way bigger business, making this uh, 3D ink, I'll call it, 3D printing filament. And then we just started scaling that. And at some point, you know, I'm very, um, I'm a lot on Instagram. So I posted it on Instagram of my garage production. And then some guy just said, yo, I don't want to buy your filament. I want to buy your machine set up for my laboratory in France. And then we were like, okay, let's go. Why not? It's a cool idea that some guy in France will be recycling using our machines. So, um, yeah, we started prototyping these machines, getting them series ready and started a machine building company. And to this day, we've sold over 70 units into 14 different countries and uh, really try to innovate like small scale 3D printing, plastic recycling and machinery. And yeah, that's a big part of our business uh, today. About 50% of our revenue comes just from building machines and selling them worldwide. Just to make sure, um, when we talk about this plastic, we'll soon get back to this, I do believe. It's, you cannot use every plastic, right? There, there, there's a dif there's a difference in the type of plastic as well as in the color for you guys. As you said, you recycled them. Um, plus when you talk about machines, are we talking about here about just, um, about 3D printers that can print with, may I simplify it as plastic? Um, no, 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 not quite. So first, and with plastics, you really have to get down to the details because there's a lot of greenwashing and a lot of fakes there because uh, recycling is really complicated and you can't just take the common end-use plastic and just say, okay, we're going to recycle this to top quality material. So what we did, um, at some point we noticed that this is not possible because, for example, if you take 10 shampoo bottles, they will have different melting points. And that means that you can't throw them all together because they won't melt at the same temperature, causing you to break your machinery. So you need to find like a waste stream that's consistent. Um, so what we identified is bottle caps. So, you know, we started collecting bottle caps at school. You know, these small bottle caps you can get in different colors that are on top of every plastic or glass bottle. And this is just how we scaled it up because you can collect these like by masses and you can sort them into colors. And um, then we also got industrial waste. So, you know, every production has some waste stream, you know, cutouts and something. So we just called up all the local manufacturers and said, yeah, do you have any waste that we can that we can try to use and make 3D printing filament? And that's how we got our waste stream sorted. And for the machinery, um, no, we do not build the 3D printers because there are other companies who build 3D printers, right? It's nothing new. Other people are way better. What we build are the machines that produce the 3D printing filament. So one step ahead. Um, because all 3D printers need 3D printing filament and we kind of make these lab scale like table scale 3D printing filament solutions that you can throw in plastic in the shredder then we have a melting device and it's melted into new filament and then the new filament gets winded up and laser diameter controlled so this machine set you know all the way from plastic waste into new 3D printing filament that's what we specialize in and that's where we sell these laboratory machines I would be curious. You, you talk about like the, the, uh, the, what you collected and um, the, 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 for the bottles, the, um, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. They, there's an international brand name of a soft drink we are not going to mention in the audio podcast, but basically are all the companies just using the same plastic for this is, or is it somehow comparable? Well, it's very, very comparable. And that's the point. And meanwhile, we are even more focused. So in Germany, there's this big glass recycling system. So many people in Germany drink um, water from glass bottles. So these glass bottles, they usually have these plastic caps. And all the glass bottles in Germany, they get washed and reused. They get refilled and then reused. But obviously, before the glass bottles are washed, they have to take the lid off. And the lid cannot be washed because it has too many... Um, too many corners and it can't be properly washed and there's this safety ring that would br uh, that has to be new so they have to take new bottle caps so before they have a big washing area they take off their bottle caps and there's six billion glass water bottles every year in germany and they are enforced to take them back and wash them out and that's where we get our um, bottle caps in like big numbers you know like millions and millions of them because for them it's just like a waste stream because they just want to refill those bottles 
and they just have to take these guys uh, take the lids off before and that's where we get them now because they can just have large quantities of very consistent uh, material because the thing is that all these water manufacturers they made like a collaboration you could say alliance and they decided okay we're all going to use the same bottle caps like the same material you know different colors but the same material and we're also going to use the same bottles because this way only the refilling part works of our business so they all use the same bottles the same you know and that's how we have a very consistent material stream the only problem was that we had all the colors mixed um, so now we built a very very exciting cap sorting machine so basically a machine where you dump in all the bottle caps and then the machine will pick out the correct colors and toss them in the right bags so that way we can take all the um, lids which would usually just be shredded together and then you would have this brown mess you know just like when water painting mix all the colors together you have a brown mess and that's what happened and that's called downcycling it's something it's a big difference downcycling and recycling so what we do is we do not downcycle we separate the colors and then we can get the two nice colors you know like um, bright blue bright red bright green and we can get these high quality colors because we sort the plastic and then we shred it and that's a big innovation our cap sorting machine and that this way we can really create high quality materials because we want to enforce the the thought that you know recycling doesn't result in brown or black i don't know uh flower pots or something but you can really make high quality products from it and that's what we're doing i have several questions here first one the guys who are manufacturing this water and recycling the bottles how did they react when you called them up and say hey can i have some bottles yeah okay how many do you want how many do you have <laughs> Two million. I have I actually right here there are two million bottle caps. It's quite crazy in this factory. Um, so what I did, I just called I made a list or you know, online. I went to I went to the local dealership for bottles, uh, you know, for for different drinks and I just wrote down all the brands that sell water in Germany. Uh, you know, mineral water. And then I just called them all, you know, it took like two weeks, you know, getting to the CEO or the head of production. And I just said, okay, right now you are getting these glass bottles back, you're washing them and refilling them. And that's really good for the environment because it's a cycle, you know, it's a cycle, it's a loop, circular economy. But the only thing that's bad about it is that all the time you're throwing away these lids. So I told them that um, right now what's happening with those lids, either they're getting burnt or they're getting downcycled into you know this black mess and if you want i can help you be part of you know the revolution of like real recycling and then i just offered them all a pilot project and i just said okay uh, i would just come over i'll do like a whole social media thing for you uh, film everything and just record and then we have two million bottle caps and then we'll record all the way from the um taking it from your factory getting it to our factory um, sorting the bottle caps, having all the different colors, shredding it into the different colors, and then continue the processing. And basically, I'll give you all the social media and press for free. And uh, that's kind of how I said uh, this would be the deal. And I also said, um, P.S., uh, if you think I'm crazy and I'm a bit too young and too ambitious, just think of it as a media budget investment because we do a lot of TikTok and Instagram for you. And uh, yeah, then luckily some some responded, and now we actually have a really strong connection with Brola Mineralwasser in Germany. Um, Brola Mineralwasser, it's a company in Koblenz. You know, it's not far from us. It's also in the same state as we are. And uh, the CEO is really young as well, um, and he's really entrepreneurial minded. And we just had the connection instantly, and he was like, "Okay, let's go. Uh, here are two million bottle caps, and let's go ahead. Let's do this. It sounds interesting. Sounds like a future." And yeah, here we are now. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. And the other question I had when you start talking about all the caps, like million of caps, how do I have to imagine it? We may tell our audience that you're in a big factory hall right now. We can see some of the equipment in the back. And what I had in mind is either somebody comes in with a small box every day and just throw them in your recycling uh, bin or that you have like, big trucks like a dozen big trucks every day pulling up or somewhere in between what what scale are you currently working on with this recycling no no um so we're not on the truck scale yet um we have like uh irregular 
uh, deliveries of like a big truck, you know, and just getting in two million bottle caps. And also we have some people, um, you know, locals who just collect the bottle caps at their cafe, you know, restaurant owners or hotel owners. Um, they just collect the bottle caps and always when they get like a big um, parcel full, they send it to us or they bring it over. And yeah, right now we are in our new factory. We just moved. Um, and yeah, this is uh, on the other side. There's a big, um, big warehouse where we store all our bottle caps. It's kind of crazy. You can literally swim in them because there's so many. Uh, we actually had a pool, a bottle cap pool once. Uh, it was very, very entertaining. That sounds pretty good. Um, let us go a little bit back because I, I do believe we went a little bit ahead of ourselves because you're so excited about your business. When you talked in other podcasts about your business, you also talked a lot about how useful it was for you to participate in all the competitions, in all the business plan competition for high school students and so on and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit about this, how this helped you yeah well we kind of went a different strategy you know you know the, the usual is like series a series b whatever or bootstrapping and we just went to a very alternative strategy because there are these youth competitions in germany where you can win um jugendgründet it's called it's a german national competition and we just said let's go ahead and the prize is like a lot of money and also a um, ticket to silicon valley And we were really hot on getting that ticket into Silicon Valley. You know, a full flight and visiting Apple, Google, Airbnb, Twitter, all the headquarters and talking to the people. So we were, okay, let's do this. And then we just went through all the phases of the competition. And, you know, you have to like write a business plan. And that's the first time where you have to set like a three year vision. You know, as a 16 year old, we were like making phone cases at the time. We had no idea. And that's where, okay, how can we make this profitable? How many would we have to sell? When would the machinery pay off? What space do we need? And all these questions were like bombarded on us. And then we slowly grasped them and wrote our business plan. We sent it away and got into the finals. And then in the finals, we had our first pitching experience. You know, we built like a booth and talked to like the investors, which were like heads of com German car companies. And then we were like, okay, this is our idea. And we got feedback. And that was really the catalyst for change um, and the catalyst for our startup. Because uh, then we participated in startup teams as well. And there the prize money is 10,000 euros. Now, I know for a lot of, of your audience, 10,000 euros is not a lot of money. But for us as a couple of high school students, that was everything we needed to get our business off the ground. So we could say startup teens, you know, the, the G German competition was our business angel because we won it. And then we had the money to kind of get off the ground and start, start ahead. And I think what's even more important about these competitions is not the prize money, but the people you meet, the network, because that's really, really the, the thing that puts you forward and not even the network, you know, at these competitions you meet with the jury, the higher ups, you know, the important people walking around and the, um, kind of judging on your idea but who we also met are friends in the same age also participating in these competitions who also have their startups and are also like 18 high school students and made their startups and these are my best friends to this day we actually lived together and like we lived in the old factory we like made a co-working space and we lived together in the old factory and just rented the room and uh, did our startup thing together and we host events together and we have parties together And this peer network of like-minded people who are really entrepreneurial, that was really what uh, got me the most value out of these startup competitions. And as we already hinted in the beginning, that basically ended giving you two businesses who are now not only two lines of business, they are legally separated. And from your imprint, I could tell they're even in different locations. Can you tell us a little bit how those two lines of business developed and where people could learn more about it? Well, um, it all started out with the phone case and making the 3D printing filament, the recycling business. And then at some point, as I mentioned before on Instagram, some guy just said, I want to buy your machines. And then I was like, okay, this sounds like a fun idea. Why not? And I grabbed the smartest people from my physics and chemistry major at school. And uh, they were like, okay, let's go. Let's do this. And then we said, okay, we're going to create a new company called Keytech Industries, uh, referencing Stark Industries from Ironman. 
and we're going to make the Jarvis product line, also referencing Iron Man. And um, yeah, that's how we started. We were four, four high school students and we said, okay, let's do this like a new business. Um, making these machines will be like a new business line. And since then, it just really developed. You know, we had new people come in and scaled the entire business, had employees, uh, got the new factory. The both businesses, uh, and that's how the machine business is kind of uh, developed. And that's where we are now. But at the same time, obviously, the recycling business didn't stop. It continued going, which I did with a couple of friends as well um, as employees. And so they both kind of simultaneously developed and scaled. And that was really good because in the machine building business, we could use the recycling business as a live testing area, you know, our live customer. And as the recycling business, we would always have like a own machine company department that would say, okay, this machine, I think it would work better this way, do it. And then, you know, this is how they would interact. And this is uh, how they interact to this day and how they profit from each other. So um, that's the real, I guess, special thing about us that we do not only build machines, but we also do the recycling. You know, we kind of are not just a, a one-sided company, but we do kind of both. And that interconnectedness really gives us the advantage in the industry because other companies, you know, imagine if you only do the recycling, they would, if something breaks, they would have to call some company and wait for repair parts. Here, you know, um, the friend who are, he was like literally at the other side of a factory, I can say, hey, this broke, we have to change this. And we just 3D print a part that's going to fix it and put it back in immediately. Um, and that's kind of the difference that sets us apart and puts us ahead. Mm. I was wondering, who are your clients for, for both businesses? Yes. So for the machines, it's uh, very um, focused on universities and research departments of big companies. So we have lots of universities, very prestigious universities who buy the 3D printing filament making machines from us because we're basically the only competitor on the market who sells these modular machines um, that have like high function uh, on lab scale. And so they, they always come to us. And also we have some R&D departments, you know, R&D departments of um, big auto industries, for example, because they want to make like their special filaments. They are not in it really for the recycling part. Um, or sometimes they are, but usually it's more like, okay, let's put some carbon fiber in our filament to make like this car part stronger. You know, and kind of change the properties and tweak it and tweak the colors. And uh, that's why they invest into these R&D uh, equipment. And those are our big customers for the machines. And on the other hand, for the recycling, um, the filament we make, we sell it to large customers as well. Um, we only do large customers because it's most convenient for us at the moment. And uh, those are just businesses that use a lot of 3D printing for prototyping, um, prototyping, engineering parts for example or they also are some businesses that actually you know do stuff with 3d printing like who actually like make products that they set you know for example customized customized adapters for um, knitting machines you know you wouldn't think of it but there's a business in that there's like a big knitting business in germany and they sell like all these customized adapters for it and they're making you know stacks stacks of money and they have like 3d printers stacked against the wall all running making adapters for knitting machines and uh, there are a lot of these businesses like this who use the power of individual 3d printing and the flexibility of 3d printing to make these very unique parts very niche parts and they just need a lot of filament and what we do is we sell them the filament and it's recycled and also our spools are made of bottle caps and the spools can be reused so, you know, usually in the industry, you would send someone a spool of filament and then at the end, they would use up the filament and the spool would have to go in the trash. And we have a spool that you can clap open and reuse. And that's really what sets us apart from other um, filament providers. And that's why these small or medium businesses who run big print farms like us. Mm -hmm. I have two questions connected to that. First, first um, you talk about the filament and the spool. And I was wondering, because not everything you are printing is a final product. Can you also take back and re-recycle things that have been 3D printed and didn't turn out as you wanted? 
Yes, yes. That's a big point of it, actually, because um, all these companies, they also fight with, you know, plastic waste because they have a lot of prototypes, you know, series productions that didn't go right, and they can just shred it and reuse it. You have to be honest and say with every recycling, you have like a 1% to 2% um, surge back on strength. Um, so, you know, we did the Sharpie test at the laboratory where you have like a hammer crashing against a plastic sample and then you can measure, okay, how much force did the hammer need to crush the sample and you can like make measurements. And we did uh, notice that with every recycling, because of the heat and, you know, the, the stress the material is um, put under, that uh, the material loses strength, but it's only minimal. Um, about one to two percent, so it doesn't really matter for most applications. If you're not a rocket scientist, um, but you know printing adapters for knitting machines, it's perfectly okay. I see. Um, let's get a little bit towards the end because we're already talking for more than twenty-five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, you talked about like the business competition being your business angel. Are you till this day bootstrapped? Yes, actually we are, um, which is, I guess, rather magnificent, magnificent after like three years of being in business. We haven't gone bankrupt. Uh, as we said at the beginning, we won a lot, we won a lot of competitions and uh, therefore had a lot of prize money. And the thing is that we took development in our own hands. So, you know, all we did is buy like some electronics and, you know, soldering iron and some... Um, just some workshop equipment so nothing where we where you would need hundreds and thousands of euros but uh, we just bootstrapped in our garage building these machines ourselves you know we never had to invest in expensive machines we built them ourselves most of our 3d um our, of our machine parts are actually 3d printed which is interesting so basically our machines that make 3d printing filament are 3d printed or like made of 3d printed parts Obviously not everything, there's some metal rods, etc., um, bearings, but uh, there's a lot of 3D printed parts in there. And that's how we could, as a couple of students with a bit of prize money, build up a successful machine building business and a successful recycling business. And um, yet yeah, to this day, we are bootstrapped, but right now um, we got, in Germany, we got something called the Gründerstipendium, um, which is like a... Uh, a state uh, funded where you get one year 1000 euros for every um, founder so now we still have like four months less where we get uh, basically we get a salary paid for and we're really free to invest it into our company so that kind of helped us but by now we also have enough profits to kind of live <laughs> live of it uh, so we're no longer and that feels really good because there was a long hard way until we reach our breaking point But um, I guess it's also different because we're students, you know. We live in uh, shitty dormitories and we don't need lots of money to pay off mortgage or, you know, have two kids and a dog. But, uh, you know, we live kind of simple. And so we don't have many engineers working for us and don't have to pay high wages. So it's kind of easier for us. So I think the biggest saving part is our um, personal costs uh, that we saved. And that's how it kind of works. But right now we are noticing the stress of it uh, because we want to make some investments um, where, or, you know, you want to scale certain parts, you know, imagine instead of having 2 million bottle caps here, having 200 million, wouldn't that be cool? So, uh, but then you kind of, uh, you can't really fund that out of prize money. So um, right now we are thinking about different models to kind of do some of the projects that we have envisioned because we have a lot of plans and we have a lot of visions. And uh, yeah, right now, some things hindering us is the, the manpower and the capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, you would be open to talk to any investors? Yes, actually. Um, it's a bit weird because our business is like, you know, we have two businesses. It's a bit complicated. Um, so I think, uh, I hope not. I think... Many investors, it's not a typical business case. Um, I think that's also why it's hard and we ha why we haven't been out there so much um, because it's a weird business case. And also the entire, you know, we're not a dating app that can scale like to 5 billion users in two seconds and, you know, make crazy of 
amount of money, you know, software you write once, sell a thousand times. We are a hardware business, you know, we build actual machines and we deliver them to actual companies, you know. We drive out in a truck and deliver them the laboratory machinery or we sell them the filament, you know, these are actual processes happening. There are real bottle caps here, real plastic being shredded and moving parts. And that's what gets me excited about the business. Um, but it's also what, I guess, uh, makes us less attractive to some of the normal investors who usually prefer software companies, sadly. Talking about excited people, how many people are currently in your team? And the last question for this interview, are you hiring? Yes, uh, we're actually, so we just moved from Oppenheim to Darmstadt. So we had in Oppenheim, we had an old supermarket, 2,600 square meters of the old supermarket where we built our production. And we were a team of like 10 people. But we just noticed that at some point we just hired everybody in Oppenheim who could code and build machines. We just ran out of people because it's a small community. Um, I know because you grow up there too, you must uh, reckon that there's just not that many IT layers there. So now we have a new factory right next to the University of Darmstadt, which is like this big, massive technical university in Germany. And here we're gonna, um, we're actually hiring a lot. We're hiring three new positions right now, paid positions um, uh, from Darmstadt students. And right now we're a team of five people. So we're five people who moved here, kind of reduced it back to the core team. And yes, now we're hiring a new mechanical engineer. We're hiring a new developer for full stack developing and also a new social media guy. And uh, yes, these are the four, three positions that we are trying to get right now. But what I also learned during my startup journey that the more people doesn't necessarily mean the better because sometimes you are faster with a smaller team. So I really learned that uh, the hard way, I guess. Um, But uh, yeah, we're still trying to get the right people together right now. So we have a good core team and we want to expand. We're ambitious. <laughs> and for everybody who would like to learn more, we'll link down your company website down here in the show notes. Everybody can free, free, feel free to reach out and look uh, at the open positions because usually this interview is heard for at least half a decade after it is published. <laughs> so maybe you're looking for some different positions. Mila, again, congratulations to your award and thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for, the, for the enabling me to be on this show. It's really been a great honor. I'm very excited to see how this show goes online and goes live and the reactions we get. And uh, yeah, we never know. Let's see what business might might be happening after this. Great. It was my pleasure. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring. When you're an entrepreneur with a great idea, it can be daunting to find funding. Startup Raven takes the process out of your hands by helping entrepreneurs connect and learn about potential investors all in one place without any long filled forms or thousand questions. Sign up for early access at startupraven.com.